crop circles and know what they are. Yes? This is a um, picture of me sitting in a crop circle in 2006. To give you an idea of how vast they are, when you're on the ground, there's no way of knowing how big they are and what the design is. That is the crop circle I was sitting in. Wow. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't show you this footage, but here is um, my own photograph of the crop circle which appeared in 2007, the largest of that time, it's 1,033 feet from top to bottom. And it's one crop circle which appeared in a very short space of time, seven minutes, wow. on the 7th of the 7th 07. <laughs> flower of life and the seed of life. The flower of life contains all the ancient sacred symbols. Inside and in the God's eye of the Vesica Pisces is another ancient sacred symbol, the seed of life, which is derived from the flower of life, as I said. Um, and the seed of life is not merely a decorative motif. It was revered in ancient Egypt in 10,500 BC in Turkey, Scandinavia, China, Greece. Met the Metatron's cube and all the platonic solids and Fibonacci spirals all derived from the flower of life geometry. Um, the seed of life, which is in the centre of this symbol, um, are linked to the biblical prophet Enoch, the archangel Metatron and the six days of creation. So it's a symbol of creation. And the Vesica Pisces is studied in the Hermetic Kabbalah and it has been called a symbol of the function of opposites and a passageway through the world's apparent polarities. And there's been a lot of crop circles symbolic of this very concept. Well, when I heard that this was in Burua, New South Wales, which is near Yass, I went, jumped in my car and immediately went down there to find it. I didn't know where exactly it was, but I thought, well, Boral is only a small country town. People are going to know where this is. And um, I spoke with all the locals, the businesses, the farmers, and nobody even wanted to know what crop circles were or where this was. I searched for two days um, in that area and could not find it. And so um, I spoke with the businesses and said, well, can you help me find some pilots or some crop dusters or helicopter pilots? So I was ringing up helicopter pilots and um, as soon as I mentioned crop circle, they hung up on me. Mm -hmm. And I did find out that there was a local light um, aircraft pilot that lives near Bulwa, who I visited myself that weekend. And I said, well, I would just love you to fly me over Bulwa because of crop circles. He didn't know what crop circles were. But he patiently listened and he was attentive and I showed him some amazing images and I told him a little bit about the science behind the crop circles. And uh, he said, well, sorry, I won't be flying you over. And I said, oh, well, if you, if you hear of them, please be in touch with me. Some of what we've heard today about DNA and um, evolution and things like that has happened time and time again. If you look at the fossil records, there have been spikes where so many evolutionary things have speeded up and come together. Lots of new species have happened all at once in that little tiny part of that time on our planet. 
So um, to hear Mary talking today about you know a, an influx of, of information coming into our genetics and our DNA, I don't think that's surprising because I think it's happened time and again. We have leaps and bounds throughout our history, um, not necessarily as human beings, but through all the other animals that have inhabited our planet since creation. So um, it's not unusual. So, the awakening, a new era for humanity, star children. I really call this an awakening to who we really are. What I found absolutely fascinating, there was a lot of hype about 2012. And, you know, um, in fact, to get my fix on that particular 21st of December, there was one of these um, 2012 movies um, on the TV and because nothing had happened I really had to fix it up somehow or other so I watched the movie. But the truth is that I think that that 2012 was actually a pivotal point for a lot of people to wake up and one of the themes that I'm getting with all those in, in touch with me from all over the globe these days is Mary I had my awakening 18 months ago or two years ago and everything in my life has changed. I no longer am interested in the material life. Everything that I used to find important and interesting is no longer interesting to me. And these aren't new agey type people at all that have been involved with this. Often it's been a lawyer, or it's been um, a real estate agent, or it's you know people you don't necessarily connect to this, um, as well as many people you know from those in the psychological field, the healing fields and what have you. And that's the term they use. I had my awakening. And sometimes, like Megan, it was, you know, actually seeing those UFOs as part of her catalyst for really <coughs> embracing the new paradigm. And for many it is that. It's actually seeing the UFO for the first time and finally realising we're not alone. Crop circles are part of that awakening, and many of the other phenomena, like orbs that we're seeing now on cameras everywhere, all these things are part of those triggers for awakening. But let's get into the children. One of the things that always stuck with me, with Mike Oram, this lo lovely gentleman who's, who's English, who I got to meet some years ago now, and he wrote the book, Does It Rain? in other dimensions. And Mike has been a UFO researcher, but also an experiencer with light beings all his life. And the thing that the children do that, are, that is absolutely profound, they'll say things that are completely out of the norm. And this is what Mike said to his mum. He said, Mum, something of great importance is going to happen. It will not happen in your lifetime, but in mine. It will affect all units of consciousness, whether they are mineral, vegetable, animal, or man. It will not happen in your lifetime, but mine. And it's to do with global consciousness, a vast change in consciousness. The energy is heading this way, and the essence of this energy is light. And the energy will repair our DNA. It will make us complete in who we really are. This is what I was trying to tell my mother and he was four years old. It was the craft, she said, that took her up, up to the bigger craft, and she even described which window she used to look out of, um, which I think is fascinating. And the other drawing, again, she's actually talking about clowning and the energy field, uh, which I think is, uh, again, quite amazing. 
What was also interesting was her little brother also saw Clowney. There's Clowney. And that was the craft that he drew. And what was interesting is he's drawn Clowney with three fingers. And also the legs are all fuzzy because it, it floated, which is really, really fascinating. And this book here was one at five years old he insisted taking to bed with him, even though he couldn't read it. And then his sister also ended up taking it. They'd alt alternate between them with this book. And for, mother never knew why they needed to take that up to bed with them. But what did blow her away, and we get into the paranormal here, which is fascinating to me, is that one day both children came down with the same book. So there were two books instead of one. Now, <laughs> part of this is just what goes with the territory. You know, it's con continually confronting our third dimensional world. Here we have some more drawings of some beings. What's interesting with this one is this young lady who's now in her 20s, but she was only, um, I think, 10 when her mother sent this to me. She was confronted by this being in the corner of the room, which had this implement here, which she didn't know what it was, but it glowed, in this one-piece suit. And she was obviously very, very scared. But what was interesting here is the flathead, and what's interesting in the one of the 13-year-old is the flat-headed beings, and then, of course, the egg-shaped being as well. So the children are drawing what they're seeing. You know, I'm absolutely convinced of that. They're not drawing it because they've seen it on television. They're drawing actually what they see. Seeing children being born, and I think very likely most people in this room are part of that, that phenomena, really, whether or not you're, you know, seven or eight now, or 78. If you're coming here, you're probably part of that program, which is part of the awakening of our species. sites around here but to begin with ladies and gentlemen you are going to get the last two periods of the day a science lesson you are going to get a science lesson and let me explain why and I'm going to have to walk around with this thing because I don't think it's still do I never uh, you're getting a science lesson simply because I'm a high school teacher and I know what anyone that's been to an Australian school system has been through and I want to share something with you before we start I've been working on app studies. I helped write the course in New South Wales for the senior, um, for the high school, for the senior course there. And I was asked to go back well, about 10 years ago, to high school. And I've been working with the elders, and they've been showing me a lot of the stuff we're going to share, a lot of stuff we're going to talk about over the next two days. And I offered this to the Department of Education for free, all the research we've done. And of course, it was a waste of time because there's just no way the education system is looking at educating people anymore. Its main function is to get people who can read and memorise a piece of paper, and that's all they're interested in. Yep. So what we then did was we decided if the school didn't want this, we just take it out to the general community. And that's what we're doing. But to do this, to explain to you some of the original history that we're aware of, we have to clean up some misconceptions. We have to clear up some of the things you've been told that the mainstream media have been telling us for quite some time, which is wrong. Now what we're going to try and do, and it sounds a bit grand to make a statement like this, is we want to tell the whole truth and nothing but the original truth. Now the Aboriginal people, we don't call them Aboriginal people, we call them original people. And for those people who don't know why, because the word ab means abnormal, abhorrent, and it's not something the original people feel comfortable with. So we do call them original people. And what we're going to do, and I'll put this back because I'm going to bounce in and out of here. No, I won't. I'll hold on to it. <laughs> <laughs> As we're going to start, 
I want to start with the science lesson and start at the very beginning. And the beginning starts like this. There are two different theories about how Aboriginal people are part of this landscape. The first is the original theory. The second is the theory of science of mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosomes and gene pro programs. We're going to look at both. But whenever we do work, whenever we go on site, we always start by doing something rather unusual. When we go into a site, we don't walk in with a preconceived idea. We don't walk in there with an idea that we think is there. We walk in with a clean slate. And we speak to the original elders and we ask for their guidance. And once they give us that guidance, and we do something unusual, we don't question it. Now I want to explain why we need to get these parameters right. Some people say to me, why aren't you looking in books? I'll tell you why. Nearly every history book you've read was written by the winners. And if you read about those winners, you won't want to listen to what they've got to say. They will sanitise and change their history to suit themselves. The original history is different because of one important factor that you need to understand. When an original tribe fights another original tribe, they will find common ground that doesn't belong to either tribe. They will fight, they'll get it done with, they'll walk away, and the whole thing is done. Nobody goes onto their land to steal it. Nobody goes on their land to rape the children or to harm people. It was done on the battlefield, man to man, and then it was finished. I guess who called the fight off me every time? The women. They decided what was finished, not the men. If I can tell you something that's quite true in every tribe in Australia, if two men within the tribe wanted to fight, they could only fight if they could find a woman to referee the fight. I'm going to get Evan to read two quotes from the paper. The scientific paper was done last year. It's not old. It's brand new. And the two things that are read there make the whole thing. It just kills the out-of-Africa theory. And that's what they've said here. They've said the out-of-Africa theory is now dead. Can you read the first one, please? A more plausible interpretation might have been both current Africans and non-Africans descended separately a more ancient common ancestor, thus forming a proverbial fork. A region where this downstream common ancestor arose would not necessarily be in Africa. In fact, it was never proven that he lived in Africa. Not as in not proven. Wait until you hear to the next part of what was found. This is what they then did. They decided, okay, there are 13 distinct African haplogroups, which is white chromosome groups, and they did a comparison. And they didn't compare against the original people, they compared against everybody that wasn't African. That's European, Caucasian, Asian, original, and any other race that may have been around at the time. And this is what they found. Not one non-African participant out of more than 400 individuals in the project tested positive to any of the 13 African subclades of haplogroup A. Okay, so that, what that means is there are 5,200 chances to get a hit. They couldn't get one. Don't tell me we came from Africa. None of us did. Now, what they also did was this chart. And the chart is interesting simply because... Oh, you've got a pointer. Could you go up to the one on the left? That... No, no. Oh, God, he's hopeless. I'll have to point it. Right. See that black mark there? There's the Africans. But can you see something? They're not derivative. They come out of something that's derivative, further down, at 180,000 years. Now, this is easy. I don't need to be a brain surgeon to work this out, because, OK, we know it's not African, because there they are. And see how they make a group of three, four? They're not the main player here. It's the other group. Now, who is that group? It can't be African. My mitochondrial DNA says it can't be European and it can't be Asian. I'll leave it there. There's only one race left. The original people. That's all you've got to, to fill in that gap. Because the mitochondrial studies made it clear they came to existence 40,000 years ago and the Africans, 120, it's done. 
The only left were the original people. So, what we now have, and I know we're doing a science lesson, I do apologise for this, but now we've got, and I won't go any further on Y chromosomes, and I won't do any more mitochondrial DNA. We now have a definite story here. It's not right. It's not out of Africa. It's probably out of Australia, but we haven't made our case yet. But we will with the next part. Now what we need to understand is I need to give you a setting of what the world was like 100,000 years ago. Not even Neanderthal, not even Cro-Magnum, a lesser man. To look at that person, if I walked past the street and I saw him, I wouldn't look the other way. I don't believe that. I don't believe they're that lesser, but that's what they said. We'll have to go with what they said. So then they just get compared all the different mitochondrial DNA. And guess what came up as the closest match on this planet? The original people. The original people are their closest ancestors. They live in Siberia. We've got a problem here. Which means for them to share mitochondrial DNA, there's only one way that can happen. And it can't be through postcards. <laughs> well, you've got to visit. So what they said was, and this is what they said, being scientists mainstream, they said, oh, well, the Denisovans must have got in a boat in South Australia. I thought, oh, you guys have made it up, because you read their books, I'll tell you, Homo sapiens the first one to solve all the continents. Now they're saying, a lesser species did it. It's a poor call. But it gets worse for them, because we now found the Denisovans live in Spain 400,000 years ago. And here's the problem. The closest match is a homo sapien called the original people, and they didn't exist till 60,000 years ago. How can they have the genes of original people 400,000 years ago when they don't come into existence for 60,000 years ago? hominids they've ever found before. And these ones had religion. And they were around 12,000 years ago. There's that other number, 12,000 years. And they actually painted their dead with red ochre. They had religion. They were no different to us. And there were two different groups there. We haven't done a mitochondrial study of them yet. I know where it's going to come. I'll tell you now, it'll be original again. It's going to be original. Now what we're finding now is we have no idea what's going on in the world today. We have no concept of what took place in the past, except there were many different hominids around, and we're going to use the Doctor Who quote, aren't we? We will use the Doctor Who quote here. When he said one day, he said, you know, I really thought the poets were going to make it. I thought the Neanderthals would get through, not the cranky apes. <laughs> Lo and behold, and the reason I bring that up is, do you know what, do you know how they would claim the people, the scientists who did the documentary said, you know how they got wiped out? According to the scientists. They said that Homo sapiens was there too, and they killed him. And we, we had a reenactment where this guy saw one, he chased him, speared him, killed him outright, pulled the spear away and walked away. And they said, well, you know, Homo sapiens are belligerent, angry animals. That's what they do. And that's how they got wiped out. We just killed them because we didn't like the look of them, I suppose. And it made it made us sound like pathetic pieces of rubbish, to be honest. But I love that training. They want us to think that, and there's a reason for that.